live from KSAT 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. This was a rigged, disgraceful trial. But the real verdict is going to be November 5th. Guilty on all counts. Tonight, former President Donald Trump has become the first former U.S. president to ever be convicted of a crime. It took a jury in New York around 10 hours over two days to find the former president guilty on 34 counts of falsifying business records in his hush money trial. This six week long trial centered around allegations that Trump falsified those business records and undermined the integrity of the 2016 election. Those allegations included the concealment of payments the former president made to adult film star Stormy Daniels. Daniels claimed she and Trump had a sexual encounter counter in 2006, which the former president has denied. In order to keep Daniels quiet, she was paid $130,000 by then Trump attorney Michael Cohen less than two weeks before the election. After the verdict was read, the former president called the trial rigged and disgraceful. As you just heard, here is more of his reaction. This was a disgrace. This was a rigged trial by a conflicted judge who was corrupt. It's a rigged trial, a disgrace. They wouldn't give us a venue change. We were at 5% or 6% in this district, in this area. This was a rigged, disgraceful trial. The real verdict is going to be November 5th by the people. And they know what happened here, and everybody knows what happened here. You have a Soros-backed DA and the whole thing, we didn't do a thing wrong. I'm a very innocent man and it's okay. I'm fighting for our country. I'm fighting for our constitution. Our whole country is being rigged right now. This was done by the Biden administration in order to wound or hurt an opponent, a political opponent. And I think it's a, just a disgrace. And we'll keep fighting, we'll fight till the end and we'll win because our country's gone to hell. We don't have the same country anymore. We have a divided mess. We're a nation in decline, serious decline. Millions and millions of people pouring into our country right now from prisons and from mental institutions, terrorists, and they're taking over our country. We have a country that's in big trouble, but this was a rigged decision right from day one with a conflicted judge who should have never been allowed to try this case, never. And we will fight for our Constitution. This is long from over. Thank you very much. Not just the former president sounding off, as you can imagine, a lot of reaction rolling in after the verdicts. Here is one from Governor Greg Abbott. He posted on X saying, quote, this was a sham show trial. The kangaroo court will never stand on appeal. Americans deserve better than a sitting U.S. president weaponizing our justice system against a political opponent all to win an election. We must fire Joe Biden in November, end quote. Senator Ted Cruz also reacting to the verdict he posted on social media saying, quote, this is a dark day for America. This entire trial has been a sham and it is nothing more than political persecution. The only reason they prosecuted Donald Trump is because Democrats are terrified that he will win reelection. This disgraceful decision is legally baseless and should be overturned promptly on appeal. Any judge with a modicum of integrity would recognize that this entire trial has been utterly fraudulent. Now to a Democrat. Here's a statement from Representative Lloyd Doggett. He says, quote, Trump is a convicted felon found guilty by a jury of his peers on all 34 counts. Though sentencing and appeal will follow, no one, including this wannabe ruler, is above the law. Now he pretends to be the victim in order to inspire more wrongdoing and the GOP concocts excuses for their felon king. This is the second jury to rule against Trump the last time was about rape, end quote. We also know that President Joe Biden, he weighed in issuing a statement too, a long statement, part of which said no one is above the law after all 34 accounts came back guilty. Okay, joining us now to weigh in on this a little bit more is a former campaign advisor to President Obama and a member of that administration. He now works right here at Trinity University in San Antonio. Professor Juan Sepulveda, thanks so much for your time. It was short notice. I'm glad you could join us today. You've, you've run a campaign on this level. You know what it is like to be part of a campaign for president. This is a day that changes history. 
Do you think that this also has the potential now with someone, a convicted felon running for president, does it have the potential to change future campaigns? I, I, yes, it does have the potential to change future campaigns, but I think the important piece is it's going gonna, it's gonna to impact what's already happening. And even before the verdict came out today, former President Trump has been using uh, the legal claims that have been coming against him to campaign, to, to fundraise, to, to really kind of dr to, to get his supporters kind of more activated to kind of support him. And so it is this is a different game. It is historic, right, to have a former president who has now been convicted of, of 34 counts of felony. But we all know as we move into the presidential campaign piece, as we get to November, if anything, you know, I can agree with former President Trump that it's really going to come down to November the 5th. But now you're going to see how this gets used by both sides, both on the Trump side to kind of say, look at the weaponization, look at the political aspects of what's really been going on. This is a sham trial versus the Democrats are showing a former president who has now been convicted. No one is above the law. And this is what you could expect if you get another four years of Trump. And so you're going to see it in the short term. But I think it also says something about the future of presidential campaigns as well. Juan, I appreciate you, again, stepping literally outside of your classroom to do an interview with us on this. We have, I think I've been saying this so often since Donald Trump has run for office so many times. Are we in uncharted territory? And what do you think the effect will be now on the race? And is it just going to harden the sides? Because we've heard that the Trump... Uh, the Trump website has already gone down because there are so many people that want to contribute in the wake of this decision. No, I, I think that's exactly right. And I think one thing we've seen from, from former President Trump is that a lot of the norms that we've had in terms of political campaigns, nothing that was legal, nothing that was set in law, it was just the way kind of business was done. Uh, he's really kind of said, I don't need to do that anymore. And so you can see in our divided, polarized country, where about half of the country has said, I agree with that, and that's the way it should be. This guy is standing up for me. He's fighting for me. And you've got the other side who's saying, this is crazy. This is chaos. This is challenging even what democracy means to be in, in the United States. And so there's no doubt that he has changed the game, right? I mean, and, and a lot of people talk a bit about this as kind of kind of a cult of personality, also kind of this notion of kind of of a populist leader. We see this in other countries as well. You're seeing it right now in the in the campaigns and the that are going on in the re-election uh, in India. We've got you no know, Mexico has got an election on Sunday with AMLO, who's kind of had some of those kinds of kind of ways of doing business as well, too. So you, you also see it not just here in the United States, but also starting to happen in other in other countries as well. Yeah, no matter how you feel about Donald Trump, he has changed the game. Juan Sepulveda, Trinity University professor, former Obama campaign advisor. Appreciate your time on such a short notice, Juan. Thanks. All right, we're going to move on to other news we are covering here at 6 o'clock today. Tonight, some new surveillance video shows three people opening fire. Take a look at this video. They are opening fire on a home in far west Bear County. And now the Bear County Sheriff's Office is asking for your help to find the three men you see right here. Yeah, they're obviously armed and dangerous. According to BCSO, the shooting happened around 4 yesterday morning on Carnes Way. It's not far from Alamo Parkway and Colaba Road. The trio is seen walking into the camera view before shooting more than a dozen times. Shortly after, the group is seen getting into what deputies believe is a light-colored Hyundai Tucson. Thankfully, no one was injured in this shooting. We did reach out. We emailed BCSO asking for more information on this case. They told us investigators believe this was a targeted shooting. If you have any information on who the suspects are, call BCSO at 210-335-6000. You can also email BCSO tips at bear.org. An update now on a man accused of shooting and killing his wife. He claimed it was an accident. Investigators don't agree. The husband now being charged with murder today. The Bear County Sheriff's Office says 64 year old Dexter Reyes facing a murder charge. The shooting happened yesterday morning on gun site pass. BCSO says Reyes initially told deputies he accidentally shot and killed his wife. Sheriff Javier Salazar believes the shooting a result of domestic violence. 
An elderly woman expected to be okay after the abandoned house next to hers caught fire and the smoke then spread into her home. This video you're seeing right now shows it comes from a different neighbor rather and flames were everywhere. You could see just how intense this fire was. It started around 830 this morning off of East Mulberry, not far from the Duseum. San Antonio fire crews say the fire was raised to a two alarm and deemed especially dangerous because it was unstable and surrounded by trees. Some surrounding homes had to be evacuated. They woke us up knocking on our door just telling us to clear our cars out and it came out and the fire was the size of the house. It was the biggest fire I've ever seen this close for sure. It's not clear if anyone was inside the home when it caught fire. One neighbor told us that people experiencing homelessness often took shelter there. The elderly woman who lives next door to that fire was checked out for that smoke inhalation. Crews are not sure of the cause yet. Let's take a look at traffic out there right now. This is the view from I-35 upper and lower level at Flores. You can see it's a little slow going, but there's no major tie ups to tell you about. And take you a quick look outside with live cam. You know, a lot of the day it kind of felt like maybe it was going to rain. Maybe we had storms. Meteorologist Adam Kasky has your full forecast coming up. The Northside Independent School District has released more details about a shooting that happened seven months ago outside a crowded high school football game. So coming up tonight in the night beat, the name of that officer and the woman that he shot and the details that led up to it all. An ethics complaint against Councilman Mark White has been allowed to proceed. Last week, local attorney Martin Phipps accused the Northeast Side Councilman of abusing his position to interfere in Phipps child custody case. City Hall reporter Garrett Berger has been following this. He joins us now here in the studio. Garrett, a lot of moving parts in these <laughs> allegations. Absolutely. So let's rewind it back a week. Now, Mark White is a first term city councilman for District 10. In his day job, he's an attorney, as is his wife, Lorian White, who at one point represented the ex-wife of Martin Phipps. That's the man who filed the complaint, another attorney. Basically, it's a whole lot of lawyers in this. What it boils down to is a night back in April where White says his wife sent him part of the conversation between a child in Phipps's home and Phipps's ex. Messages that White said made him worried about the child's safety. Now, there's a lot of back and forth over who texted or called at what point, and we got a lot of that broken down online. You can go back and read our story from that, the original one from a week ago. But in short, the councilman says he tried to get a hold of Police Chief William McManus, but wasn't able to, but White was at an event with other officials, including the Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar, who after talking with White, sent someone over to Phipps's house, where San Antonio police had apparently already arrived. Though a child in the home said Phipps had grabbed and shaken them by the arms, police didn't see any injuries and didn't remove the child. White provided screenshots that indicated Phipps's ex had already likely called police. And he's also said he has a duty to report suspected abuse. And White, while Phipps says White was butting into a private family matter on behalf of his wife and her client, who in this case is Phipps's ex. Now, Phipps filed a complaint last week with specific accusations, including conflict of interest, unfair advancement of private interest, prestige in office and improper influence, and misusing public property and resources. Now, the city hired an outside attorney to check into that complaint. And yesterday, that attorney determined that most of the alleged violations can go forward to the Ethics Review Board, though part of this conflict of interest claim that was dropped. OK, so. so if only part of it was dropped, what does this mean going forward? Well, basically, it's going to continue on to the Ethics Review Board. That's a panel of citizens appointed by the council and the mayor. And White's going to have the chance to rebut the claims. He has uh, basically until next week, it sounds like, to do that. And that's when he's saying he's planning on doing that. And there could be another round of response and rebuttal after that. But it sounds like this likely will make its way to a hearing where they're going to hash things out. And it sounds like that should be a public meeting. All right, so what's the possible outcome here? If, if, if White is found guilty of wrongdoing, what's the outcome? Well, basically, it sounds like the board can recommend a couple things, but I just want to rewind. I just got confirmation that that hearing, that is up to the board, so it's not mandatory. Okay. We may not end up seeing this at a hearing, but if the board does have to deliver a uh, 
an assessment with 90 days. They either say that they dismiss the viol they dismiss the accusations or they say a violation has occurred. If they do, they either refer criminal prosecution or civil civil remedies or they could say why they don't think any action is necessary. But we're going to see something within about 90 days. Yeah. I'm glad you brought your phone out here so we can get the very latest <laughs> I on, did. This, on this whole thing. <laughs> I've been going back and forth trying to trying to yeah. make sure we have the latest. Well, but there's so many moving parts in this. I was going to say, we'll need you to stay on top of it because it's a little complicated. Oh, yeah, and it's going to it's even better. So we're at the 90-day window. That's going to end up being right in the middle of when they're starting budget. So uh, just throw that in the middle of everything the as well. Yeah, all right. Yeah, thank you. Got it. Right. All right, let's check out the weather situation right now. And like I said, kind of overcast, kind of felt like maybe we were going to get some rain. It was still plenty hot out there. Yeah, I'll tell you what, Adam, and it's just it's here. It's almost June. Oh, it is almost June. <laughs> yes, it is almost June and it's almost the official start to meteorological summer, which is June 1st and kicking off hurricane season then as well. Let's uh, take a look at our storm chances here going forward the rest of this evening and tonight. They get up to 30% later on tonight. Now, I really want to stress that our storm chances, they, they hinge on the activity in North Texas and West Texas and a wild card is some of the outflow boundaries that could move our way. So here's the big picture and another day of soaking rain in parts of North Texas, particularly from Wichita Falls, Dallas, Fort Worth, points eastward on into Texarkana, Lufkin, Bryan College Station as well. But also the Panhandle in West Texas, we're seeing some development. And that's important because as we've been talking about for a few days, this is the kind of weather pattern where the steering flow up above us can provide the leftovers of some of these storms and there's still time for more development out there and organization. So for example, here's a computer model that's picking up on all this activity out there, starting to develop more over the coming hours, and then it pushes the remnants of that activity closer to us overnight tonight. And it's also one of those patterns where when we get the leftovers, it's typically a nocturnal situation. We get them at night or in the early morning, and that's what this computer model does have pushing in. Now, just because this model showing rain, don't think it's a slam dunk. These are very erratic weather patterns, and one wild card is outflow boundaries from some of those pre-existing storms that could kick up their own storms or stabilize our atmosphere. So we get into this pattern, I'd say fairly, fairly frequently this time of year with that steering flow aloft where we put the focus on West Texas and North Texas and we're just circling back into it. It's a bit of a wait and see. And then from there we can assess what kind of impact it's going to have on our area. Chances out at 30% for tonight. Temperature right now at 93 degrees in town, Rio Medina 97. When you factor in the humidity, it does feel like triple digits. 104 of the feels like Converse, Port SA, 100 the feels like in New Braunfels. Tomorrow, we start the day with a 30% chance. Again, even some of the leftovers could be impacting the morning commute tomorrow morning. 76 degrees in the morning, 93 in the afternoon, and then tomorrow night again, we'll see that 30% chance because of a new round of showers and storms could be developing in North and West Texas, and we could be getting some of the leftovers. Some of this also hinges on just how quickly our atmosphere can rebound from showers and storms and destabilize again. Many factors coming together. We're watching it all. Tomorrow afternoon, Del Rio 100. Catula Carrizo Springs 101, feeling the heat. 91 in Holotus, 95 on the south side at Stinson. Bulverde 91 tomorrow. Divine in Hondo, 96 year high. We do get into the upper 90s by early next week, Monday and Tuesday. And I do want to point out the next couple of nights we're in that same situation. We're just wait, sitting back, waiting and watching for some of the West and North Texas leftovers. <laughs> the leftovers. All right. Thanks, Adam. All right. Can the Timberwolves do something that's never been done before? Can they come back? from down 3-0. They definitely feel like they have the team to come back down from three games to none to win the Western Conference Finals and advance to the NBA Finals. Coming up, they're gonna host the Mavericks tonight for game five, and in soccer, San Antonio FC will get another opportunity on Saturday. Coming up. After coming 
through in game four on the road to fight off elimination in the Western Conference Finals. The Minnesota Timberwolves will try to beat the Dallas Mavericks in game five tonight. No NBA team has ever come back from an 0-3 hole to win a playoff series, but don't tell that to the T-Wolves because they feel they have the right team to change history. We have a lot of guys that believe and that, uh, that want to win. You know, and obviously it's when you're on the brink of getting eliminated uh, from your goal, from your dream, uh, uh, sometimes maybe the urgency and everything else is, a, is at a higher level. I think everybody's pretty locked in. Um, you know, you, you get one, you kind of want to build on that. So everybody's super excited to, to go out there because we have another chance and, um, you know, just to compete. Here's Mavs rookie center Derek Lively at shoot around this morning. He missed game four after suffering a sprained neck in the second quarter of game three when he was inadvertently kneed in the back of the head by Minnesota's Carl Anthony Towns. And this morning, Lively was asked if he's in pain. Discomfort, we're, going, we're not going to call it pain, we're going to call it discomfort. But, you know, everything in my neck was locked up from uh, right after I got hit. So it's just been a lot of treatment, a lot of stretching, and just a lot of just being able to just know what my body, listening to what my body's telling me. At last check, Lively will be a game time decision and game five is tonight, 730 at the Target Center. San Antonio FC is home this week in the host Memphis 901 FC and Memphis is coming in on a run. They're undefeated their last five games with four wins and a draw and they sit fourth in the Western Conference with 16 points. SCFC is currently eighth holding the final playoff spot with 14 points. Their last win was April 20th at Hartford and since then they've had two draws and two losses. San Antonio is dealing with a lot of injuries but man they're still trying their best. Uh, again, it's, uh, as I mentioned, an opportunity for growth, continue to work on our mentality, um, you know, being the aggressors, uh, focus on executing our individual actions, um, make Memphis uncomfortable. With what we have available is how can we sustain, and this comes down to mentality, how can we sustain that mentality over the course of 90 minutes, which is incredibly difficult to do. Mm -hmm. But as we say here, we make no excuses. That's, that's our goal, that's our objective, and, and we make best efforts to just try to sustain that mentality. Marcina and co will host Memphis 901 FC Saturday at Toyota Field at 8 p.m. Bay Bay McClinton All Sports Speed and Conditioning will hold an open house this Saturday at 1225 Triplett Street, located near San Antonio International Airport. His guests will include guys he's trained and former NFL players N.D. Kalu, Priest Holmes, and Eric Brown, just to name a few. Bay Bay wants to show off his gym that features a waist, a weight side, and a speed and agility side. Speed gets you anywhere. Um, so that's what I'm really trying to do is focus on these young kids, middle school, high school, uh, fifth graders also, you know, trying to get them more advanced in the running speed, trying to get stronger. You know, I'm just trying to open it up to the public to see what we're doing, um, trying to get more kids to come sign up, um, let the parents see what's going on in here. And we just want to have a fun time. We're going to have food, drinks, music, and a little bit of Q&A with the guys. The open house is this Saturday from noon to 2 p.m. The information is on your screen. Do you have to be a kid to go? Nah. I mean, you don't have to be a kid. You, you go. like in your 50s? And yeah, go hang out. Say hi. Yeah, because uh, he'll baby. welcome you. Yeah. Food and yeah. drinks at a gym. The right kind of gym. <laughs> <laughs> they got to be good for you, right? <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Our Doc Talk coming up next. It's Thursday. That means it's time for Doc Talk. Dr. Dina Tom, pediatric hospitalist with University Health and UT Health San Antonio. We've got a lot of great questions from our viewers this week. Mm -hmm. So let's get right to it. It's all about the kids. Okay, first viewer question for Dr. Tom. Why does my 11 year old have low iron levels? Okay, so first of all, you, we don't usually know that our kids have low iron levels unless they're checking on purpose. So my guess is that probably um, this viewer's 11 year old might have anemia. So anemia is a fancy way of saying that we have low blood counts and the most common cause of anemia is low iron. So we usually go looking for iron when we see that our, our patients are anemic. In kids, the most common cause of iron deficiency anemia, which is low iron, is usually nutritional. So they may not be eating foods that are high in iron, such as protein rich foods like meat, seafood, poultry, beans, um, and then other kind of green leafy vegetables. 
And in an 11 year old, I would always ask if they have, you know, gone through puberty yet because another cause of iron, low iron levels in girls who've gone through puberty are irregular or heavy periods. So those would be the biggest reasons, but um, definitely want to get on some iron supplements if it's too low or start a diet that's rich in iron levels. What are signs of low iron levels in kids? Signs that you yeah. should look for that. Usually it's um, being mindful that they're kind of tired. Um, it's that fatigue that they feel they want to sleep all the time. And that could be hard in kids, especially oh gosh, teenagers. Teenagers, yeah. yes. They're tired all the time, they stay up too late. So really it's that fatigue. Sometimes um, being pale, but as parents that see our children every day, I, that comes up a lot where we don't really notice it. It's a family member or a friend who hasn't seen our child in a while who says, hey, your kid looks pale. And if they say that, maybe check with the doctor to see if maybe they have low, low iron. Mm, okay. Yeah. All right. A, a good viewer question for this time of year. What are the signs of dehydration in children and how can I prevent it from happening to my child? Hey, yes, it's getting hot outside, so we have to be really mindful, especially in San Antonio, to drink plenty of fluids because we don't realize that ourselves and our children, um, we lose a lot of fluid through sweat, and then humidity keeps us from maintaining it because we don't really feel it right away. The signs of dehydration really are um, most you know, you can tell dry lips, uh, kind of dry skin, but in kids, it's pretty easy because they don't um, pee as much. And that's really, we can monitor that a little bit more in young kids, so we wanna be mindful of that. A child and adult should go to the bathroom once every six hours. So as long as your infant, toddler, you know, our teenagers, we're not asking a lot, but if we're worried about it, we should ask, have you peed in the last six hours? How many times have you peed today? Because that's a pretty good objective measure of dehydration, but feeling um, that kind of jittery feeling and then dry lips, um, and then being mindful if they're vomiting or having diarrhea, that they're gonna need more fluids. And obviously drinking a lot of water Yes. is is the first part of how do I prevent yes. dehydration. Are there some drinks that can accelerate dehydration? Good question. That's like a medical school level question right there. Look at you. Yes. <laughs> Good job. Wow. Yeah, so there are actually. Um, so water is great preventatively. Um, once a child's gotten dehydrate, you know, they have de dehydration, you want to make sure you're using like Pedialyte or those electrolyte packets that you can buy yeah. in the baby section and mix them with a, a liter of water because those have potassium and, and sodium and everything. So really high sugary drinks actually do the opposite. So we feel good that our kids are drinking apple juice, orange juice, um, sodas, but really apple juice is the one we see most often, but that high sugar content makes the child pee more. And that's not a good pee because they're they're right. following that sugar out with water. So really try to avoid those sugary drinks when you're trying to prevent or or cure dehydration. Okay. Good question. All right, next viewer question. What is the best way to handle minor cuts and scrapes children get while playing outdoors? Simply enough, really just using soap and water, gentle soap and water to wash that cut or scrape off. And uh, doesn't necessarily even have to be antibacterial, just a soft soap and then drying it, patting it dry, and using a little topical um, uh, cream or antibiotic cream over it. I personally like bacitracin. Um, a lot of people don't realize you can buy that over the counter at CVS or Walgreens or HEB, um, but I prefer that more than Neosporin because some kids get a little allergic reaction to Neosporin and then they're wondering why their kid has a rash around their cut. So, um, but the triple antibiotic ointment or, or bacitracin is fine. Okay. All right. A lot of road trips, mm -hmm. yes. a lot of people in cars. What's the best way to help with car sickness in children? Yes. So car sickness is actually normal in about a quarter of the population. So I have car sickness pretty bad. My daughter has it. Um, so I know the, my triggers. And, and it's a natural, normal response for our brains to deal with different input of direction. So it typically happens, um, for those of us who get it, when we're reading, um, and the car is moving because yeah. we're doing something, our brain is processing something still, but our body is moving in space and we can sense our peripheral vision driving, right? So um, knowing your triggers is most important. And then kids don't do a really great job. They don't know how to express that they're getting car sick. So, you know, my daughter, the first time she got it was on an airplane with turbulence. And she said, I have airplane breath, breath in my mouth. And, and I was like, I think she's car sick. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, really watching your kid for those signs of like feeling that they're sick or they're gonna throw up and um, having them look straight out 
at the car where they're going, get some fresh air, giving them a little bit of a snack if they haven't eaten in a while because you don't want that low blood sugar, and then just drinking a little bit of water. If you can pull over safely on the side of the road, have them walk around a little bit, that would help. Yeah, my son likes to read in the car, and that's what he told yes. me. I said, put the book down, buddy. That's to. why you're not feeling yeah. good. It's time. <laughs> it's time. Yeah. Dr. Tom, thanks so much. No we want more viewer questions. We do this every Thursday here on the News at 6, so scan this QR code. Let us know what medical questions you have. We will take them straight to local doctors. By the way, you gave me a compliment, and our producers in my ear going, oh, great. <laughs> yeah, he said he something won't forget nice. It. <laughs> Honorary medical student. Yeah, thank Honorary. you. Thank Honorary you. medical student. Good to see you. Yeah. We'll be right thank back. You. <laughs>we're hearing now from the prosecution in the case against former president donald trump as you know all 34 counts came back guilty this afternoon yeah it all centered around a hush money trial that happened before his election to president of the united states the manhattan district attorney alvin bragg speaking just moments ago the 12 everyday jurors vowed to make a decision based on the evidence and the law and the evidence and the law alone. Their deliberations led them to a unanimous conclusion beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, Donald J. Trump, is guilty of 34 counts of falsifying business records in the first degree to conceal a scheme to corrupt the 2016 election. And while this defendant may be unlike any other in American history, we arrived at this trial and ultimately today at this verdict in the same manner as every other case that comes through the courtroom doors by following the facts and the law and doing so without fear or favor. The former president will be sentenced on July 11th. Now, the judge could sentence Trump to probation or up to four years for each count in state prison with a maximum of 20 years. It is expected that the former president will appeal this decision. All right, back here at home, look outside with live cam once again. Some pretty clouds out there, pretty hot. And we're also talking about these nighttime rain chances in the future, Adam. Yeah, not just the diurnal convection, but nocturnal convection we could have. I say those words for Myra because she loves... <laughs> I get a kick out of them. Diurnal <laughs> convection. Hey, flows, rolls right off the tongue. Uh, so we also, uh, you know, have some more heat to talk about. And not only that, the new drought monitor is in. I'll show you that along with, we have a thermometer winner today. We're going to get right to it in just a bit. Hey, Adam, I just saw you carrying around a beautiful thermometer. Yeah. And that's how we were reminded <laughs> the significance of this day. That is Thermometer Thursday. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the significance of this day. We're going to get to that, and I'll tell you how you can win a homemade thermometer. And I've been working on a lot of them. And I learned something new from Santa Jim the other day I'm going to share with you, which is pretty neat. just goes beyond the actual thermometer, but the uh, importance of the backboard and the uni uniqueness of it. Anyway, let's get uh, right to our time lapse from today. And you notice how we don't see downtown as easily as we did in day uh, yesterday. That's because the smoke's back a bit. It's a little bit thicker than what we had yesterday. Yesterday, you could actually see bright blue in the sky. It wasn't milky blue. And you notice in the forecast for smoke, it, it, the tendency is for it to get a little bit thicker by Saturday. You see this slightly denser column starting to push northward a little bit. So don't be surprised if you notice it more in the sky as we get into Saturday. Rain chances, 20% the next few hours, 30% later tonight from 10 o'clock all the way through the morning commute tomorrow. I wish we could really raise those chances. We just don't have a lot of confidence in everything pulling together the way it needs to. Obviously, we could use it. The newest drought monitor in is in. No changes for us around here, but keep in mind, this does not take into account the recent rainfall that we had late on Tuesday because the data cutoff for the analysis of the drought monitor is Tuesday morning and we end the rain Tuesday evening and Tuesday night. But this is the bullseye of the drought monitor in our area with the extreme drought, Fredericksburg, Kerrville Comfort, Bernie Bandera, almost stretching into Hondo now. And I do think some of the rain that we had will have a little bit of impact there, but not exactly a big drought denter. So our rain chances going forward hinge on a few factors. 
And one of the main ones is the storms in North Texas and storms in West Texas. Look at these severe thunderstorm and tornado watch boxes that are already in effect because we're in the type of flow pattern above us with the steering winds where if these storms organize and come together, we can get the leftovers of them such as the other night. We got the leftovers of West Texas storms and we see this period, this, uh, this pattern fairly frequently around here. And here's one computer model showing that activity coming together a bit. And then notice as we go through tonight, some of the leftovers could make it here in the late night slash early morning hours and possibly even into the morning commute. Problem is this type of pattern isn't a slam dunk because we don't have a very defined forcing mechanism and we have uh, other wild cards, uh, cards such as outflow boundaries that can kickstart new storms or stabilize the atmosphere as a, after it moves through. So that's why we just have that 30%. You look at the future cast and say, well, come on, looks like a slam dunk. It's not that simple in these cases. 93 degrees out there right now feels like 100 when you factor in the humidity. 95 Rio Medina, Gonzalez at 91, along with Mick Nixon. You look at the dew points, though. Dewey's well or right near 70 degrees, and in some cases in the mid 70s, closer to the Gulf Coast. So it feels like we're a little over 100. Tomorrow morning, on the lookout for some leftover showers and rumbles of thunder, 76 degrees. And then again, tomorrow night, we're on the lookout, waiting and seeing what those storms in West and North Texas do hoping for some leftovers 93 by the way the high temperature tomorrow but along the Rio Grande will be uh, probably right around or just at triple digits all right taking a look at our seven day forecast the next few nights so storm chances and then it's pretty quiet in upper 90s by Monday so Santa Jim was just helping me out big time and he um, cut out a bunch of these thermometer backboards for me and notice how he mixed wood types. We've got some white oak sandwiched in between purple heartwood. Now notice how it's not all completely purple yet on that purple heartwood. That word oak shouldn't be there still, but you know, that's our new graphic system. Anyway, I didn't know that you know, the natural color of that wood is purple. I knew that, but I didn't know that it turns purple when exposed to light. These ah. were sitting in a box for quite some time, not exposed to light. So just the top part of it that was getting a little bit of light turned purple, but the inside part hasn't turned purple yet. So it's the exposure to light that actually causes this type of wood to get that purple color. So I have it out in light and I hope to get a good comparison shot for you. But that's why it just looks like it's been kind of brushed on there with that purple. Interesting. Never knew that about the purple heart wood. I mean, I knew it was naturally that color. I just didn't know that um, it was in reaction to light anyway. Today's homemade thermometer winner, Janie Gray Pruitt of Converse. By the way, you can go to ksat.com slash thermometer to enter the drawing. And so, you know, part of that purple heartwood is it's so unique to the backboard. It's not just the thermometer, but also the uniqueness of the backboard. And I've got a couple dozen of them that we're working on right now. I, have yeah. you made a thermometer with that purple heartwood before? I actually have. I okay. have a couple of them in the past, but I've never visually seen that color change yeah. occur. Yeah, that's wow. fascinating. Really cool. Yeah, I like it. Mm -hmm. Let's see the finished product. Yep. The buzz coming up next. In Scotland, a museum is allowing visitors to come face to face with their ancestors. Visitors at the Perth Museum in Scotland are being greeted with faces from Scotland's past. These are the faces of people who lived thousands of years ago across Perth and Kinross. The faces blink. They change expressions as mu museum goers pass by. An anthropologist and researcher created digital facial reconstructions of people who lived during the Bronze Age Iron Age and medieval period. Museum goers can even tweak the hair and eye color for some of these recreations. That would freak me out. Yeah, that's a little A little freaky. bit, yeah. All right, what time is it on the moon? Scientists say it's urgent that we find out, so they're working on a way to send clocks to the moon. So far, scientists have found a single day would be roughly 56 microseconds shorter on the moon 
than it is on Earth. Yeah, it's a tiny number, but scientists say it could lead to significant inconsistencies over time. They hope to create a new method of time tracking that accurately measures lunar time as it is, while ensuring it can be related back to Earth time. The White House is asking NASA to map out a plan by the end of this year. Yeah, you could get those clocks to say New York, <laughs> L.A., yeah. London, the moon. Yeah, that's what we're missing. Yeah. That is all our time. Thanks for watching the News at 6. See you right back here on the Night Beat at 10.